Hey, at some point, we've all wondered this. You've wondered it, I've wondered it, we've all wondered this. We've wondered, why would a good God allow bad things to happen? Maybe you haven't used those exact words, but in some sort of sentence, we've all wondered that question. Why would a good God allow bad things to happen? For some of you, this question spelled the end of your faith. It, 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 was, you, it was too much to ponder, too much to wrestle with, and, and you decided that a good God and bad things, they don't coexist, that there's no way that you could be a part of this. You see, what we often do, though, is most of us, we focus on bad things that are out there. It's all about the bad out there. We, we always forget about the bad that's actually in here. You see, when we say, why would a good God allow bad things to happen? We're thinking bad out there, not bad in here. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question, and please, wherever you're watching, don't raise your hands. But the follow-up question is this. Have you ever done anything bad? Have you ever done anything bad? Or have you thought about doing something really, really, really bad? And the only reason you didn't go through with it because you were afraid that you might get caught. And if you got caught doing that really, really, really bad thing, you know you'd go to prison. But if you thought without a shadow of a doubt that you would get away with it, maybe, just maybe, you would have gone through with it. I know that I've had some thoughts that maybe go along those lines. I've never met anybody who doubts the existence of God based on their own badness. I've never heard someone say, how could a good God allow me to happen? How could a good God allow me to happen? Here's another version of saying it. If God was good, <laughs> he would have done something about me by now. We go, I'm not talking about my bad things. I'm talking about the big bad things, the bad things out there. But once you begin to look at the big bad things as opposed to the little bad things in your heart or that you have done or that you've thought about doing, you change the question and suddenly you're in the world of how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood. This way of thinking leads to an unfalsified premise which make it meaningless. It makes it meaningless to begin with because if you chase it down to its logical extreme, when you get to the end of the question, here's what you end up with. If you get to the end of the question of how could a good God allow bad things to happen, if you get to the end of the question, here's what you end up with. I don't believe God exists because I exist. I don't believe God exists because I exist. The only way for a good God to prove to me that he exists is to eliminate all evil and potential evil, including me. And if he did that, then I wouldn't be around. I wouldn't be around to see God take away the evil, which means that this whole conversation, this whole argument is meaningless. See, I think if John were here, I think if John were here who knew Jesus, who was around with Jesus, who saw Jesus with his own eyes, who heard Jesus with his own ears. I think if John were here and he heard the conversation that we're having right now or the conversations that you have with people about how we reconcile a good God with evil in the world, he would say something like this. He would say, hang on. Hang on a minute. Let me say, I saw something. I saw something with my own eyes that may help. I saw God in a body coexist with evil men. And when I say evil men, I'm just not talking about kind of evil. I am talking about extremely evil men. I saw God in a body coexist with evil men on earth. And he didn't prove he was God by eliminating them. He didn't prove he was God by eliminating all evil. He did something else. He did something else. Instead of eliminating me, he loved me. Instead of eliminating me, he went to work eliminating the evil in me. He didn't prove he was God by eliminating all evil. What he did was he loved everyone and he went to work at eliminating the evil in people. Today, we're in part six of our series, Bystander, and the subtitle is John 
and the, and the rabbi from Nazareth. And what John does is he organizes his account around these seven signs. And these aren't just seven random miracles. These aren't just seven uh, random acts of kindness. No, these are seven signs. And we know this, that signs, they point you to something. And these signs were pointing us to the identity of Jesus. Jesus was making some blasphemous claims about himself that people just would have a really hard time believing. But these signs pointed that Jesus was indeed who he claimed to be. And today we're coming up to the sixth sixth sign. And we left off last time with Jesus in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And all throughout this series, Jesus has been going from Jerusalem to Galilee, Jerusalem to Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem area to Galilee. See, Jesus is from the area of Galilee and there was a lot more peace. There wasn't much tension. But when he came to Jerusalem, there was often tension, especially when he went into the temples. He would have confrontation with the religious leaders in the temples and the disciples were not in a comfortable place. They did not feel good about going to Jerusalem. So whenever Jesus tried to go to Jerusalem, they would sort of question, are you sure, Jesus? Do we really need to go there? I mean, last time you saw what happened, we don't want to relive that. How about we just stay in Galilee? We don't need to go to Jerusalem. But Jesus, he's in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And and one afternoon in the temple courts, which again made his disciples nervous because when Jesus was in Galilee, it was present. But in Jerusalem, specifically in the temple, there was often conflict, conflict. And so when he was in the temple, temple leaders asked him, how long will you keep us in suspense? How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah... Just tell us plainly, how long will you keep us in suspense? These temple leaders asked, and they said, if you are the Messiah, just tell us. And Jesus responds like this. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. (laughs) In other words, I didn't just tell you, I showed you. I didn't just tell you with my words, but what I've been doing is I've been showing you that I am indeed the Messiah, that I am indeed sent from God. I've given you evidence and you just won't embrace it. And they wouldn't embrace it because like many of us, they were willfully blind. They would not look at what could be seen. Then at this point, Jesus decides to go all in. He decides to go all in. Jesus, he leaves Jerusalem and goes a little bit Uh, goes a little bit of a distance away and and people would know where he is and know where he's up to. And what Jesus does next is extraordinary. What Jesus does next is unbelievable. Jesus manufactures, I believe, a sign. He manufactures a sign. He gave the entire community a sign that was so indisputable that it forced the hand of the willfully blind. (coughs) It says, I know you have been willing to not look at what could be seen, but I'm going to do something that you cannot turn a blind eye to. I am going to do something that you must see, that you are going to see. There's no ignoring this. Here's what happened. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So Bethany, you need to know, was about a day and a half walk from Jerusalem. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So the sisters, they send a messenger and Jesus is about a day and a half walks away. So the messenger finally finds Jesus and the disciples. And the messenger says that Mary and Martha sent me and they wanted me to tell you that the one that you love is sick. I mean, first of all, imagine being so close to Jesus that you don't even need to be called by name. You're just given the title, the one that he loves, and he knows exactly who you're talking about. It's a pretty special thing. It's amazing. And so when he heard this from the messenger that Martha and Mary sent to say that the one he loved, that Lazarus was sick, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. This sickness will not end in death. But Lazarus, of course, because it was a day and a half walk for this messenger, Lazarus died as the messenger was on his way to see Jesus. 
when, so when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory. It is for God's glory. And if you've never heard this story, you're hearing this for the first time, you'd go, wait. This is for God's glory. This sickness is for God's glory. What are you talking about? So, so according to Jesus, bad things don't disprove God. John would say, yes, but there's more. There's so much more. So hang tight. Don't close the book. Keep reading what I documented. And as I am dictating this, as I'm remembering what happened, I continue to be blown away off of what I saw and what I heard. And please keep going. There's so much more. We're just getting started. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. So this sickness, this evil was left unattended on purpose because it had a purpose? This is so uncomfortable because it's so not intuitive. It's so uncomfortable and so not intuitive. John knows his readers and the people that are following along in the story are going to think, what? What? How could this be? So what John does is he jumps into the story and makes an editorial comment so that we won't just close the book. So we won't just be offended and say, no, nope, no, nope, I'm done here. He makes an editorial comment. This is what he says. He says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. Why does John tell us that? Why? It, it sure doesn't look like it. Sometimes... It doesn't look like it for us either, does it? Sometimes when we're expecting God to intervene, sometimes when we aren't doing well or someone we love aren't doing well, it looks like God's doing nothing. Sometimes it looks like, does, does he even care? Does he love me? Does he see me? Does he notice me? This is why I believe Jesus manufactured this sign. It wasn't for the people sitting around that circle. It, it was for you. And it was for me. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. He stayed where he was two more days, which is strange for people around him because he had healed total strangers instantaneously. <coughs> instantaneously. He didn't wait. He didn't dawdle around. He would just heal them right then and there. And he's going to stay two more days this didn't make sense. Why did he not rush off and heal his friend Lazarus? He was up to something. He was staging a sign with a purpose in mind. So two days go by, the messenger goes back to Bethany, and Jesus and his guys are hanging out, doing whatever they were doing. And then he said to his disciples, so after two days, the messenger has gone back. He says out of the blue, all right, let us go back to Judea. Let's go. Let's go specifically towards Bethany. The disciples were confused because last time they went there, it didn't go so well. As we were about to find out when Jesus had confrontation there, people were, were about to pick up rocks to stone Jesus. I mean, they were really upset with him. And the thing about being around someone that's about to be stoned is that people that are throwing rocks often don't have the best aim. Just talk to my wife. No, people that are throwing rocks, they might miss. And so the disciples that are around Jesus who is being threatened to be stoned, they're in danger because people might miss Jesus and hit him. So they're not too keen to go back to this place where they feel their life is in danger. So they say, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews were there, tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? They were raising the real issue by questioning, you want us to go back there? Can, can you just go without us? I mean, we're, we can hold down the fort here. How about you go for a little bit of a walk? We know you're going to come back this way. We'll just wait for you here. Then Jesus does his Jesus thing. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Are there not 12 hours? What? Weren't we just talking about something completely, completely different? Something, com something else? What do you mean there are only 12 hours of daylight? Jesus, you're not making any sense. He says, anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble 
for they see by this world's light. <clears throat> Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. They may have thought, thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for telling us how light works, that it's safer to walk in the light than it is at night. What's his point? What is your point, Jesus? And as this narrative unfolds, as this manufacture sign unfolds in history, the point of what Jesus is saying here becomes crystal clear. It becomes so clear. Twelve hours equals opportunity. Twelve hours equals opportunity. Follow the light of the world while the light of the world is in the world. You'll never see it more clearly than you see it right now. While I am here on this earth, the light will never be brighter than it is right now. And when I leave, it will be dark indeed. So follow the light of the world while it is in the world. You'll never see more clearly than you do right now. If you stay here out of fear, you will live to regret it. You'll stumble around in the darkness trying to make sense out of life that makes no sense. Because apart from the author of life, you'll eventually find yourself backed into a corner of despair. Or as Richard Dawkins says, he says, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, and Jesus is saying to you, and Jesus is saying to me, follow me, follow me. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world that came into the world to bring light to your world. And apart from the author of life, it will all seem meaningless. And you will stumble around the darkness trying to piece together things that you'll never be able to piece together Follow me. Follow the light. Let me light up your world. After, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to there to wake him up. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Jesus was asking, who's in? Who's going with me? Let's go. Then, then they give Jesus some medical advice. We, we do that too. Sometimes when we pray, we go, dear heavenly father, uh, this is what the doctor said. This is what the dentist, this is what the specialist says. And we give Jesus a complete medical rundown of what happened. And then we say, and we sort of tell him what we need to do. Anyhow, they give Jesus medical advice. This is what he says. Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Lord, sleep equals recovery. We just got to let him sleep. We don't need to go. It's all good. We, we can avoid this tension. We can avoid the conflict. Jesus is like, thank you, Andrew. If that's the case, let's just stay here and, and make s'mores and let him get better on his own, right? Jesus had been speaking of Lazarus's death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly. They, they weren't really understanding what Jesus was laying down. Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And they're thinking, wait a minute. You just told us two days ago that this sickness was not going to end in death. And now you're telling us that he's dead? What, what is going on here, Jesus? What does this mean? I thought you told us that he was going to be okay. And what comes next is terrible if you're Martha, Mary, or Lazarus. But what comes next is wonderful if you're you. It's wonderful if you're me. Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there. It was for your sake and for my sake. For all of us, Jesus manufactures a sign. They had no category for this because it was brand new. And what it did was it gave hope for future generations. It gave hope for the world for all time. I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Lazarus is dead and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Let us go to him. 
And then one of the more humorous parts of the New Testament, this is, then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, all right, let us also go that, that we may die with him. <laughs> let us also go that me, we may die with him. He's essentially saying, it's over, guys. <clears throat> Lazarus is dead. If Jesus goes, he'll be dead because of the conflict and the tension. Let's just all go together and let's just all die together. Meanwhile, back in Bethany, they are wondering, where is Jesus? We sent the messenger. He's back. Jesus isn't here. Doesn't he love us? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he want to see my brother Lazarus be healed? Where is Jesus? We know that if he was here, he would be able to prevent what's happening. Where is he? And on his arrival, on Jesus' arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. He'd already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. God, you could have, but you didn't. God, you could have, but you didn't. Isn't it, isn't it nice to know that there's nothing wrong with your faith when something doesn't go your way? That, that bad things happen to good, godly, friend of Jesus people? And, and in this case, Jesus manufactured a sign for your sake, a sign for my sake. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. So after Martha had sort of gone through this this argument with Jesus, this tension with Jesus, she goes, she musters up whatever faith she could find and says, okay, this isn't ideal. This isn't how I imagined. I'm actually pretty angry with you, God. And see, what we need to do, friends, is you don't need to hide your disappointment. You don't need to pretend like everything is okay. Jesus' close friends were not happy with how things were going, and they didn't just hide it. They went to him with how they were feeling. And church, friends, you don't need to hide how you're feeling from Jesus. You don't need to hide it. You just need to encounter him where you are at. And so Martha, she she goes, Jesus, if you would have come four days ago, My brother, he would not be dead. He would be alive. And so after she has that that conversation with Jesus, she she musters up the faith and she goes, okay, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of, at the last day. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But I'm not concerned about the last day, Jesus. I wanted you to get here so we didn't have to wait for the last day. And what comes next is so breathtaking that we miss it because we're not there and we haven't felt the frustration that they did. Jesus was saying to her, look at me, Martha. I'm not here to give you a theology lesson. I'm not asking you to trust in what you've been taught. I know that you, you've been, you, you know about the resurrection and, and you know that it will happen on the last day. I know you've got this theology, but I'm not here to teach you about theology. I'm not here to, to lecture you on what you've been taught. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life personified. And I love this because John is is dictating this and who would ever come up with these type of words to put them in Jesus' mouth? See, John is remembering the words that he heard Jesus said and I'm just imagining him and and just remembering this moment, remembering this jaw-dropping, standing in awe moment and saying, yes, Jesus said that that I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Just as he said, Lazarus would not die, but yet he did. In the same way, you'll die, but you won't. Death is simply a door. Then he looks at her and he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? I mean, that's a lot to believe, isn't it? That's a lot for you to believe. That's a lot for me to believe. Martha, Martha felt the same way. So she mustered up as much faith as she possibly could in that moment. And she says, yes, Lord. She replied, do you believe this? Jesus asked her, yes, Lord. I don't understand it, but I don't have to understand everything. I don't really understand why you waited two days. I don't understand what you're thinking about is to come. I don't understand everything, but just as we talked about last week, we don't have to understand everything to believe something. We don't have to understand everything to muster up some faith in us. Martha says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I believe. I believe one thing. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I believe, I believe, I don't, I don't really understand everything Martha would say, but I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And Martha tells Mary that Jesus is on the edge of town. So she goes to him and has a similar, similar conversation that Martha and Jesus had just had. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, so there was a bit of a crowd, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And so he says, where have you laid him? Come and see, they replied. And so when Jesus arrives outside the tomb, He pauses. He pauses and he enters into an emotional moment. He he enters into the emotion of the moment with divine empathy. Peter, who was also there, would later write to Christians, cast all your cares on him, knowing that he cares for you. Cast all your cares on him. I was with Jesus in this moment where he went into deep empathy, where he was in the emotions of the moment and he cared for everyone that was around Lazarus. He cared for people in that moment. And I'm writing to you Christians all around the world, Peter would say, cast all your cares on him because you can know very well, I saw it, that he cares for you. I saw it with my own eyes. He would tell us, I, I saw, that's why what John records next isn't just a trivial detail. That's why what John, these two words that John records next are so powerful or are so, uh, give us such insight to the person of Jesus and who he is and how he feels about you. And I'm so glad that the writers or or who compiled the Bibles with the chapters and the verses gave these two words its own verse. John says, as he's dictating this, as he's remembering, yeah, that's right. Jesus wept. Jesus wept in the emotions of the moment. He felt such empathy for the people around. He says that Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? See see what the state of Jesus is right now? See how he loved him? But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? There's our question. Why didn't he do something about this? Why didn't Jesus do something about this earlier when he had the opportunity to do something? Why didn't he do something? If he could have, he would have. But since he didn't, he can't. As he could have, he would have. But since he didn't, that just turns out that he can't. Well, as it turned out, he could have. But he didn't. He he chose instead to condense eternity. He, He condensed eternity 
eternity condensed to the span of a single afternoon. He condensed the pain, the disappointment, the fear, the unanswered prayers, the faith, the tears of God, and then finally the resolution of the entire life experience for all mankind into a few hours, one afternoon, so that future generations could live with hope. He condensed eternity into one afternoon so that you could live with hope, so that I could live with hope. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb, and he said, take away the stone. Take away the stone. And all the commotion stopped. The, the mourners fell silent. Everyone could not believe what they had just heard. Mary and Martha gasped. But Lord, said Martha, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. He has been there for so long that it's not going to smell good. Why are you asking us to open it? We put him down in a state that we could remember him in a nice way. Now you want us to open the tomb. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that, <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. I, I, I'm saying this out loud for the benefit of the people standing here. I know that you hear me, but I'm saying this for the people that are standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. You see, the most important question to wrestle to the ground in this world isn't good and evil. Isn't if there is a good God, why are bad things happening? That's not the question that you start with. That's not the question that you need to wrestle the ground. The question that you need to wrestle to the ground is who is Jesus? Because if Jesus is who he claimed he was, then all of those things get reconciled and explained in Jesus. It's not about good and evil. It's about who is Jesus. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And John, who remembers this and dictates it, thinks to himself, and we could not believe what we saw. We couldn't believe what we saw. The dead man came out, his hands and feet still wrapped with strips of linen, and a cloth around his face. And nobody moved. In fact, everybody took another step back because they were in awe and they couldn't believe what they saw. This Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days and all of a sudden he's coming out of the tomb and they go, holy, who are you, Jesus? Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. He, don't just stand there, do something. And so they all run to Lazarus and they, they take off the strips of linen, and they take the cloth off his, face, off his face. And then a statement that John didn't need to make, he says, but he did anyway. John adds a statement he didn't need to make, but he, he adds it anyways. Therefore, <laughs> many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. <laughs> I bet they did. I mean, wouldn't you? Don't you? Many who saw, believed. Here's John's formula. Many who saw what Jesus did, many who saw the signs of Jesus, believed. Many who saw, they, before they saw what they saw, they did not believe. And this is John's point. I'm not asking you to believe just to believe. I'm not asking you to have faith in faith. I'm not asking you to follow Jesus because of faith. I just want you to know what I saw. Because if you saw what I saw, if you hear the stories of what I saw, and if you trust me as somebody as giving a testimony of the things that I saw, then perhaps you will arrive at the same conclusion that I did. Not about the things that Jesus did, not about what he did, but that you would arrive at the conclusion about who Jesus is, that he is indeed the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. Most skeptics agree that Christianity could not have grown to the numbers documented three centuries later apart 
from explosive growth in the early days. Why did so many Judeans follow Jesus? Was it because of their faith? No. It was because of what they saw. Seeing was believing, which led to trusting. It was such indisputable evidence that Jesus' opponents called a meeting and decided Jesus and Lazarus had to die. This was such, such conclusive evidence that Jesus was who he says he was, that his opponents called a meeting and said that, hey, Jesus needs to die. Why? Why? Because if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. There is no more willful blindness. There, there is no more turning a blind eye. We cannot dispute the things that Jesus is doing and we see the chaos that it's causing and we want everything to go back to normal. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nations. If we don't do something about this Jesus guy right now, the Romans are going to come and intervene and, and take the power away from us. They are going to handle the situation the only way that they know how to handle. And John must have chuckled as he dictated that lie, that, that line. Because no one let Jesus do or kept him from doing anything. See, God had come to dwell alongside evil men and women. The light was so bright. The light was so bright. The light would never be brighter than it was in those moments. Jesus didn't come to abolish all evil. Jesus didn't come to eliminate evil. Jesus came to love everyone always. Jesus came to love everyone and then start to do something about the evil that is in our hearts. John would say at another point regarding, because some people would accept the light and some people were more opposed to the light, they were more put off by the light. He says, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds <clears throat> were evil. God didn't eliminate the evil. He placed it on his son so that you would not perish, but you would have eternal life. John, he was just a bystander, but he saw and believed, and eventually he got his story out with an agenda. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I wrote these downs because I saw things Jesus do that I just can't explain. I saw Jesus do and say things that put the exclamation mark on that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And I came to the conclusion that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and I want to document everything that I heard and everything that I saw in hopes that you would also come to the conclusion that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may find life in his name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Father, as we head into next week and as we head into reflecting what he did for us on the cross and as we celebrate the resurrection and the life that comes with the resurrection, God, I pray that that truth would never wear thin on us, God. That we would never become numb to the power of the resurrection and what it meant for us, God. We're so grateful for your grace and that you love us so much that you sent your son to reconcile the relationship between you and your creation. So God, this week as we go from here, let us be reminded of the power of the resurrection. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.